All right, why don't we get started? Greetings, everyone. Delighted you could be here, and I know we've got others online. I am Tim Massad. I'm a research fellow here, and I'm also the director of a new project we started last year called the Digital Assets Policy Project, which I'll just give a word or two about. With that project, we try to organize the occasional event like this where we have someone come in and uh, who's active in the whole general area of crypto, digital assets, stable coins, central bank digital currencies. And uh, last year we had uh, several speakers come up and we're hoping to have uh, some more this year. So just watch the uh, website or watch for notices on that. Um, and we're also just trying to get the Kennedy School more involved in in the passions in this whole space. I should say that I am also an advisor to PayPal, so full disclosure there. Um, and I am just delighted that Jose Fernandez could be with us today. Jose is the Senior Vice President and General Manager at PayPal for blockchain, crypto, and digital currencies. And he's been there, how long have you been at PayPal? Uh, this is my ninth year. Ninth year, I and mean, you were at BBVA before that and also at McKinsey, but you've been in the payment space for quite Best a part of the last 20 years. <laughs> right. So a lot of experience in the payment space. So as you uh, know, PayPal launched a stable coin uh, on August 7th, I think it was. Uh, it is regulated under New York law and they have been rolling it out and ramping it up. And so Jose is going to tell us more about this. So why don't we start with why did you guys decide to do this? <laughs> uh, well, as uh, as we were just saying, I've been in payments for the best part of the last 20 years, and I think that this is the first time that I have seen a technology that has the potential to radically change payments. And, and this is not something that was obviously easy, and it's not something that was uh, short. We, it had been in the works. We started on the PayPal side to work on digital currencies. I think it was August of 2019. So not started on stablecoin at that stage, but we started to tinker with the technology because as, if you look at the evolution of fintech over the last few years or the last, not so few, the last 20 years at least that I've observed, a lot of the innovation in fintech and payments that we have seen is basically innovation in the user experience. It's a better user experience on the same traditional payment rails. If you think about it, probably the last fundamental innovation in payments was the credit card as a form factor, and this was in the 50s, and, and the emergence of, of SWIFT for international payments. So the, the reason that we got so intrigued, and, and we started with a, with a research group way back then, and we started to kick the tires of different protocols. And there was a moment in which we were doing transactions in a pre-production environment at one hundredth of a cent per transaction. If you put that in context, and I, and definitely, and in production today, you would see things like one cent per transaction, but, but definitely in that lab environment, we were doing 100 of a cent. If you think about it, the cost of an ACH transaction is around 50 cents. ACH is, is basically funding it with your bank account. It's basically between 30 and, and 50 cents. The cost of a debit card transaction is between 30 basis points to 70 basis points. So. If you have a technology that, that allows you to do payments 26 times cheaper, I don't think that that's a technology that you can let pass by you if you're in payments. So that, that was the fundamental reasoning that drove us there. Um, and what do you see as the use cases for this? I mean, crypto stable coins so far really originated as a way to facilitate people trading crypto. Um, they were a way to easily move value between exchanges or trading platforms and between tokens. And frankly, they were a way because a lot of those trading platforms had trouble getting bank accounts or sustaining bank accounts. It was kind of an easier way to stay connected to the dollar system. What are the use cases for PayPal? So we have spent a ton of time and we, had a, we have had many regulatory conversations around use cases. I'll give you a few. I will not dodge the, the, the question, but maybe a couple of considerations, a preamble. This is a 
platform product. So one of the things that happens when you have something that literally that, that radically reduces the cost base is that you're going to put it out there and people are going to use it for stuff that has nothing to do with the use cases that I'm going to be about to, to talk about. Interestingly enough, we have been live in the market for four weeks. Last week, a company called BitPay, which is a crypto payment system provider, basically someone who helps merchant, merchants accept crypto as a payment instrument, uh, issued a press release that they are supporting uh, PayUSD as one of the stable coins and put our video and we are doing all these things. I have never spoken to BitPay. I mean, I did many years ago, but we didn't do anything. You just put this thing, this is the beauty of open source instruments. You put it out there and people will build on, on, on top of it. Uh, the other consideration is a, that is a point that comes very often in conversations with regulators in, in different versions. The polite version is what is the use case. Uh, the, the more passive aggressive version is why do you need blockchain for X? And the fact of the matter is that for many things you don't. And the more perverse side of it is, I don't think that that's something that the regulators should be considering a lot. They should be taking care of financial stability. They should be taking care of consumer protections. But vetting use cases is not what regulators do best. So I, I don't think that is... And this is something that in general terms, not only for blockchain, but more in general for innovation, the burden of the proof is not on the innovator to prove that there is a use case. The arbiter of that is the market, not the regulatory environment. The regulatory environment should be there to provide the guardrails and again, ensure that there are a series of rules by which people should operate. But it is not a prerequisite that the regulator accepts your, your use case. It's not what they are there to, to do. And after this winding way, I'll, I'll go to your question on, on, on use cases. Look, I don't think that we will see a stable coins in mainstream payments tomorrow. I think that we will continue to see a stable coins in Web3 and, and crypto environments because it is just a better tool for the job. For the reasons that you were saying, there is a scarcity in the connectivity to fiat rails. If you are trading in crypto markets, it just is easier and faster and cheaper to move from, say, Bitcoin to a stable coin and then Think of that as the cash portion of your brokerage account. It's easier to do that on an instrument that is that is crypto native. And if you're interacting with NFTs or you're interacting with a DeFi pool, it just makes much more sense to do that on something that is crypto denominated. So that will continue to be a large use case. And of the, let's see, about 120 billion worth of fiat back stable coins are out there today. The vast majority of that is on crypto trading use cases. That will continue to be probably the most pervasive case in the next, let's say, couple of years. I do think that we will start to see that, and that's our bet, in some specific verticals for everyday payments. Uh, the first one that we have been talking a lot, and, and Tim, you and I discuss uh, a lot about this in, in our conversations, is digital goods. So when you're thinking of things like the, the digital goods economy, sometimes folks dismiss gaming and video games as, as, as child's play, there is a $150 billion economy in digital goods that happen, uh, happen every year. And if you're a developer who are selling digital goods in a place like Minecraft or Roblox, current payment rails will get you your money in about 30 to 45 days after you have sold. And the main reason for that is on the one side, the app stores going through Google and Apple, et cetera. And on the other side, Existing payment rails are not very efficient for micropayments. So if you're selling things that are a cent, the cents on the dollar, it's really, really difficult. You will need to accumulate and then you get 10 bucks uh, uh, at a time. If you can do something, again, going back to the main primitive, that is 26 times cheaper, then you can do, you can stream payments. You can charge on a video game by the minute as opposed to paying 60 bucks for, for the game. You can do a number of things that you cannot do with traditional payment rails. So digital goods is one. There is another one that I'm actually very excited about, which is uh, B2B payments, especially B2 small B payments. If you think about cross-border payments, the cost metrics that I talk about are even steeper than on retail payments. So the cost of a wire, if you are an American company who's paying a supplier in Indonesia, you're going to send a wire that is going to cost you anywhere between 45 to 100 bucks. Is going to, your money is going to vanish in cyberspace for three to five days, and you hope it's going to show up on the other side in local currency. 
and, and you're gonna pay in a spread on top of that. If you go, to, if you offer an alternative in the market that settles in 15 minutes, not in, not in five days, that costs 1400 times less than that wire and that you can do 24 seven, not nine to five, Monday to Friday in banking hours. And that has none of the concerns uh, associated with KYC and AML because B2B flows are, everybody understands that you will need to identify the sender of the receiver. I do believe that that's where you're gonna to start to see some additional activity. I was in, in one of the roundtables team that you invited me uh, last year. One of the participants in the roundtable who works for another stablecoin provider was saying, hey, we are already seeing hundreds of millions of dollars in volume on a stable coins monthly uh, that happen basically for B2B business. Hundreds of millions of dollars is a drop in the ocean, but I do believe that you will see adoption, adoption there. there. There are others, cross-border e-commerce and others, but if you, if you want to focus on two use cases, if you're building in the space, my advice would be digital goods, B2B, especially B2 small B payments. And I wonder if you've seen any evidence of this or thought about this. I mean, is that B2B take up more likely in countries that have real-time payments or that don't have real-time payments? You know, I mean, the U.S. doesn't really have uh, extensive real-time payments, right? They're rolling out FedNow. We'll see how much take up there is of that. We have a private system that the banks run. But a lot of corporates don't use that. Whereas you go abroad, as we've talked, lots of countries have real time payments. So does that make it more likely that people say, oh, stable coin, I, you know, I can use that. I'm used to, you know, I'm ready. To, I'm, I, my systems are set up to do real time. Uh, or would it be more that companies here that say are facing those delays would use it? What do you think? So uh, this is not information, it's gut feel, but I think that if you go to the list of OECD countries and you find out who does not have real-time payments, probably it's a segment of one, and hopefully that will get fixed uh, soon. Um, Real-time time payments are mostly domestic payments. So I, I think that you will see adoption for cross-border payments first, because nobody has real-time cross-border payments. So everything goes to SWIFT, and that's something that is that, that will happen earlier. For domestic real-time payments, there is a very interesting debate. One of the, why do you need blockchain for X? One of the corollaries is if we're gonna have FedNow. And it seems like we are getting FedNow finally, which is which is excellent. Uh, FedNow, another real, by the way, we have had versions of real-time payments in the US for quite a while. There is a, the competition for FedNow is an is a, right. is a system that's called RTP, real-time payments that is operated by the other clearinghouse in the US and has been around for a while. If you all are using Zelle to send money to friends, I'm sure that for some of your banks, they're gonna be using RTP. So, and, and even in that context, stable coins have been growing for the last year. So I think that that is proof that stable coins and, and real-time payment systems can coexist. Real-time payments for domestic B2B, they will exist, but still they are basically an instrument for interbank settlement. So you need to, go through a paper, through a bank account to be able to do that. I do believe that you will see, there are things that, that surprise me. One of the things that I that I have the privilege of running on the PayPal remittance a business, a company called Zoom that does billions of dollars in, in cross-border remittances, and actually has a very sizable uh, business in domestic remittances. So this is people who are using remittance channels to send money from one state in the US to a different state in the US, which are going to say, why would you would you do that? So people will use it in different ways. But to your point, I think that the most attractive segment for B2B payments now is cross-border more than domestic. Though I will, I think that you will see adoption in domestic payments too. Mm -hmm. So what's, um, tell us a little bit about the reaction so far. What are, you, what are you hearing from people? What are you, you know, what kind of feedback are you getting on this? So the reaction from the community in the market has been really, really good. For those of you who are less familiar with the market structure for the stable coins, what you see today is there is a very large one of the, let me break down those 120 billion outstanding, about 80 billion of the 120 uh, is USDT, which is a stable coin Tether. issued Tether. by Tether. Uh, it's a company outside of the US and not regulated in the US uh, with self-reported the reserves of the assets that are backing the, the stable coin. So there is a degree of lack of transparency and lack of certainty of, of the assets. Despite that, 
uh, is the most adopted uh, stablecoin, especially in international markets. The second one, and the first one of those who are regulated in the US is USDC that is issued by uh, Circle, which is a money transmitter here in, in the US, and they have around 30 billion or, or so. And then there is a very large gap to the next four or five who are anywhere between 100 million and 300 million. Uh, there is an acute sentiment in the market that that equilibrium of two large competitors that was evolving toward a duopoly and only, and actually if you're thinking about the regulated in the US version, it's almost a monopoly. Uh, and I think that in the crypto trading community, there was a strong appetite for alternatives. So I think that many folks were happy to have a, basically anyone issue an alternative and they were happy that that PayPal was part of it. So the reaction from the community has been has been very strong. For those of you who are familiar with the crypto community, it's famously polarized and, and they love a, a good debate. So there is a side of, I, I try to stay away from crypto Twitter, but if, if you double there, you will see that a, a lot of positivity in the reception for additional alternatives, a lot of uh, strongly positive reaction to kind of the endorsement that you see traditional finance names like PayPal's getting in the community. Not only PayPal, if you have been following the news over the last three to four months, especially the asset managers have been very active in the space. BlackRock uh, applying for a Bitcoin ETF, Fidelity, a Wisdom Tree, and a few others. So that kind of mm -hmm. uh, acknowledgement that the industry is here to stay has been a strong validation by the community. And then you have the part of the community who are very much on the decentralized censorship resistance and all of that, who are much more on the Bitcoin side of it, which they don't like it and they don't like anything that is not Bitcoin, and that is fine. We're obviously not forcing anyone to to use it. Well, you mentioned BlackRock. I mean, let's talk about that because to my mind, you know, sure, BlackRock and Fidelity have made moves in this space, but it's basically catering to the desires of people to purchase crypto. Your move, to my mind, is the first time that a traditional finance company has said we're entering this space because we think it provides a technological advantage and a core financial function and really it's i think it's kind of the first time that a traditional financial company has really made a significant commitment to blockchain to decentralized blockchains is that uh, I, I think that is right. The, and, and, and again, and that's testament to some of, especially the, the, the leadership of Dan Schulman, our CEO, who has been a, a very visionary in that, in that sense. Uh, I think that we have probably been the first. I think that we will be by no means the, right. the last. And if you think of, to your point on BlackRock, there is actually an interesting thing there, which is the application to of things like a Bitcoin ETF is definitely helping people buy. If you listen to the public declarations of Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, he's definitely interested in that. But he is talking about, hey, this might do two ETFs, what ETFs lead to mutual funds. So if you can automate the back office, if you can reduce the cost of trading, if you can reduce, if you can go, you can move the TCC, the, the, the clearing corporation from T plus one and T plus two to settlement in 24 for the 48 hours to settlement of stocks and funds in 15 minutes that does reduce the cost because yeah. because the underlying asset is crypto that somehow that that will have an effect generally correct if you can tokenize uh, uh, equity or or stock or a mutual yeah, fund right. and then you can move it and you can go right, to because settlement it's, it's in same day settlement it's an example of tokenizing something and and, and, and if you're handling 9 trillions in assets and you can reduce float by 2 days Right. That's meaningful money that is out there. Right. No, I think that's a, that's an interesting point because, I mean, I think to my mind where a lot of the activity goes is in tokenizing other assets. It's not the stuff we've seen to date so much of tokens that aren't really tied to anything else, but rather tokenizing stocks, tokenizing bonds, tokenizing real estate, whatever, and then think about how that moves. And it's interesting to observe that the assets that are being tokenized are the assets that were already liquid, right? The, the way that if you want uh, the thought experiment that we do with our stable coin is that it is in essence tokenized PayPal, PayPal balance. So yeah. many of you who I hope and trust that have PayPal or Venmo accounts uh, have some balance in, in those wallets. 
uh, which is a fantastic store value that you can move around the network, but you require that your counterparty has uh, a PayPal right. account. This is the first time, and, and technically the stablecoin is not tokenized balance, but that's a useful analogy because now you have something that is PayPal balance, but you can send outside the payment. That's what is actually very, very interesting for us. The other day I sent a PayUSD, I sent our stablecoin from a MetaMask wallet to a Phantom wallet. For those of you familiar with the space, two Web3 wallets that have nothing to do with PayPal whatsoever. The sender had no relationship with PayPal. The receiver had no relationship with, pay, with PayPal. And for the first time, you were seeing a PayPal asset move between, between uh, two wallets. And you mentioned PayPal and Venmo. Of course, one of the curious things about this is you've owned Venmo, but people could not value from their PayPal account to a Venmo account, but now they can. Is that right? Through using yeah. I mean, will so, they able to with the stablecoin? That's another very good example of why do you need a blockchain to do X? <laughs> you don't need a blockchain to send value from PayPal. PayPal and Venmo have been sister products for 10 years. Uh, you don't need blockchains to send value from PayPal. Every, any payments engineer worth uh, their, their salt will design you four or five ways in which you can move money from PayPal to Venmo without a blockchain. The fact is that the first transfer of value between a PayPal wallet and a Venmo wallet was a Bitcoin transfer when we enable on-chain transfers from, from a Venmo wallet. And we said uh, our stablecoin is not live on, on Venmo yet, uh, but we did announce that we're going to be supporting that very, very soon. So that's going to be a super interesting case for wallet interoperability. So wallet interoperability has been the holy grail of peer-to-peer -peer payments for a while. Uh, the analogy is SMS. You might remember, I'm sure the team, you and I remember, I don't know if, if the audience does remember the, the, the timing which you can only send SMSs to you, to people who have your same carrier. So you could only send SMSs from T-Mobile to T-Mobile phones. Uh, and when, quite frankly, forced by the regulation, especially in Europe, when interoperability was forced, the volume of SMS went through the roof. So today, if you want to send to your Venmo friends, if you're having dinner Friday night with your friends, you want to split the, the tab and you start to do that bargaining of, hey, I'm paying, you have Venmo, I have Cash App, I have PayPal, who takes the, the who, who pays for what? This is gonna be the first time that you will be able to do fast, free, basically instant transfers between a PayPal wallet and a Venmo wallet. And I'm actually very intrigued to see what it's gonna do to volumes. The, the case for it is, you have some overlap. You have people who have PayPal wallets and Venmo wallets, but it's not that as high as you would imagine. So the, the, there is a, a big segment of folks that only have PayPal accounts or only have Venmo accounts. If you believe in network theory, the value of the network is proportional to the, to the number of the users. We are adding millions of nodes to each of those networks. And you need to believe that the network is gonna be more, more useful. Mm -hmm. And is not close to PayPal and Venmo users. You're using any other wallet who supports crypto, and they decide to support the stablecoin. You can do, you can get that done. The case for it is the SMS case. The case against it, just to not not to be all uh, starry eyed, is that one of the arguments for SMS is that interoperability made a ton of sense because the barrier for nobody would be carrying two different SIM cards to be able to do two different carriers. Uh, so the barrier of adoption for multiple phones was higher. Well, arguably somebody would say, yeah, it's not such a big deal to download one other PayPal app or Cash app or Venmo app to be able mm -hmm. to interact with my friends. But again, I'm a data-driven person. I, I like the evidence and I think that we are about to see the evidence. So you've mentioned cost as a principal reason. Are there other advantages to a stable coin or to using this technology that you think you'll capitalize on? I think the three commandments are cost to speed and, and programmability. And one of the caveats is throughput and, and yeah. scalability. So we talked about cost. Yeah, I sure said speed, but yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, speed is an important one. So because people tend to forget that faster is cheaper. So maybe less so people are less aware in consumer payments. But one of the emerging use cases that we are seeing, I, I was talking to the CEO of one of the largest exchanges in Mexico the other day. And he was sharing that one of the uses that they're seeing for stable coins are 
subsidiaries of U.S. corporates in Mexico that are using a stablecoin to bring funds back from Mexico to, to the U.S. So they change pesos into USD stablecoins, they send the stablecoin to the U.S., and then withdraw that for the treasury. And the reason they're doing that is settlement in 15 minutes versus three days. And three days of float, if you're a large uh, enterprise in, and you're managing the treasury there, is money. So I think the cost and speed are fairly straightforward. The next one that is probably even more relevant, though we have not seen implementations just yet, is programmability. So the, the fact that, and one of the reasons that we deployed on, on the Ethereum protocol versus others is that I really do like this concept of a, of a global virtual machine. The fact that you can write code and that the money can be programmed and you can execute code that makes money do things. Uh, as I'm sure you know, PayPal and eBay were, were joined at the hip for a long, long time. And one of the problems that eBay had was reputation management and how you were sure that when you were buying something from some seller somewhere that actually the thing was going to show up at, at your door and how to handle all that. And it's a big problem in marketplaces, reputation management and uh, and in payments, dispute resolution is, is a big problem. When you receive something that is significantly not, not as advertised or you don't receive it. If you can program payments, meaning that, and this is a little bit of science fiction, but but close enough, where I trigger a payment, the money leaves my account, goes into a scroll account on a scroll wallet on the blockchain, and when you PS the my door, that get that triggers the release of the payment, and I as a as a payer cannot prevent that because the money has already left. And the payee cannot receive the money before that real life event the UPS has, has delivered, then you're basically streamlining a lot of that dispute resolution. Whether that grows at scale definitely will not work okay. Ethereum protocol or the current blockchain protocols because the throughput is not there. The, the scalability of Bitcoin was thought for something else, but getting there fast enough. And, and the oracles, the ability to collect real life data that then you can feed back to the blockchain is getting there. So that program, and that is just a, a one use case. Where and think of that if you're thinking about the absurd process to buy real estate uh, to, when you need to buy a home. Um, I grew up in Spain. I came to the U.S. 12 years ago. It still blows my mind the whole structure around deeds and titles of property <laughs> and how you do all, all all that and the inefficiency of what you need to pay the realtor. And and if you can digitize those property titles, if you can handle uh, scroll accounts through. Blockchain, you, you need to believe that you can extract oligopoly rents from the system from the system and give them back to consumers. So the stablecoin is a very important innovation for you all, but it's a small part of your business today. And the rest of your business is heavily tied into Visa and MasterCard and big banks. How does this affect that those relationships? How are, and how are Visa and MasterCard looking? I think that we need to give a lot of credit to specifically to Visa and, and MasterCard. They have been much more forward-looking than intuitively you would you would expect. Uh, I think that they see they are technology companies of, of of a sort, and they understand that when you have a superior technology, the market defies gravity for a while, but not forever. So they having and they have teams dedicated to to the same things that we have been doing. And some of the, the news flow that you see coming from them, I think it's pointed to the right direction. I think that you saw a, a few months back that both Visa and MasterCard are enabling stable coins as a settlement currency for the networks. Uh, going down a little bit on the rabbit hole of, of payments. When you pay with a debit card, the imagine that you're a crypto company that is issuing debit cards. Many of them are Coinbase and others saying, hey, this is a debit card you can pay anywhere. We're going to debit your crypto funds and you can pay anywhere that MasterCard is accepted or, or Visa is accepted. What happens on the background is that when you use that debit card that pits down on, on, on the street, Coinbase will sell Bitcoin if it is Bitcoin what you have associated. They will charge you about 2% to do that. They will uh, That will become fiat on a bank account and then they will move the fiat to MasterCard and the MasterCard will give it to Pits. What they are doing now is by uh, by enabling stable coins as a settlement currency from the for the consumer. Basically, what you're saying is 
the Bitcoin go the Bitcoin goes to a stablecoin and Mastercard themselves will receive a stablecoin, and then they will change the stablecoin to fiat and give it to Bits, uh, which is already live on a, at a pilot stage. Getting that at a scale is very relevant. Even more relevant is the next leg of that transaction, which is I have my debit card that is associated to a stablecoin balance. I give the stablecoin to MasterCard. MasterCard settles with the merchant in a stablecoin because then you start to have an economy that is circulating in stablecoin and it's not going. You can, the anal again, analogy is layer two protocols. You could exist in stablecoins as long as you have very easy on ramps and off ramps that when mm -hmm. you need to go back to the banking system, you can go back to the banking system. That's why a lot of what we see as our mission in the ecosystem is to build a conduit between fiat and Web3. Because I don't think that the banks are going anywhere. I'm a, I am not shouldn't say that, but I, I, I have been a banker in the past. And bankers are fundamental, banks are fundamentally important in a number of ways for customer deposits, for fractional reserves, for credit in the economy. Right. I don't think that we can go, go to, a, to an, a system of full reserve banking. But being able to move quickly from fiat to Web3, from fiat to digital representations of fiat and back is something that is super important. Mm. Um, so you're on the Ethereum blockchain. Tether and USDC are on multiple chains. They are. How did you think about that issue? Of what chain and how many? I, I, I can tell you why we went to, to Ethereum and where some of the considerations. Uh, as you were saying, uh, Circle is in, I think it's high single digits of, of chains and they have announced that they're going to a number of, of others. Uh, Tether as well, most of the volume of Tether, interestingly, is on a blockchain called Tron, Tron. that is actually a terrible, terrible blockchain, yeah. but it has been around for quite a while. And most of the activity of Tether happens on, on Tron. It's interesting because if you see, I would, if you're interested in stable coins, I would highly recommend to read a report that uh, Brevan Howard, the hedge fund, just published mm -hmm. because they actually look at stable coin activity, including Tron and their contention. And I agree with. Peter Johnson, the, the author of the study, is if you're not looking at Tron, you're not looking at stablecoin activity. 60% mm -hmm. of the activity of the largest stablecoin is happening on, on Tron. Mm -hmm. The reason we went to Ethereum is, is twofold. First one, uh, maybe threefold. The first one is I like that virtual machine construct. I like, I think that Bitcoin is fantastic for what it was built to do. But if you care about that programmability <clears throat> and applications built on top of the EVM, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, that construct was very, very appealing to, to us. Second is a battle-tested protocol. Uh, I've been involved with blockchain for eight years now, and the number of layer one protocols that have come and gone, and the number of security breaches in some of those early stage protocols, when they are immature protocols and immature technologies, there is risk associated to that. And Ethereum has been battle-tested uh, is it perfect? No, it's much better in my mind than others that are out there. Yes, uh, and even regulators kind of agree. All the stable coins that have been approved by the New York DFS are Ethereum stable coins with one exception, I believe, that is issued on, on Stellar. Uh, it's that aspect of it. And then it's the developer community. Uh, crypto is a very developer-driven environment. Uh, we very early decided that there would not be no PayPal protocol because we don't tell developers where to go, they tell us where to go. So the, the, the community is building on Ethereum, then we will be on the, on the Ethereum side. Mm -hmm. Ethereum has constraints uh, and, and throughput is, is not great. And if you want to do retail payments at scale, you need to be able to process around a thousand transactions per second, which you cannot do on the Ethereum uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of avenues that, that we are exploring. And, and, and again, part of the criticism for, for the community uh, from the community in terms of say everybody, hey, we like Ethereum, but if you're going to do micropayments, you're going to do it if the Ethereum gas fees on one given oh, on a given day are going to be five dollars or or whatnot. Uh, and it's a valid point. It's less relevant if you're moving ten million from a Mexican subsidiary of a U.S. enterprise. That the five dollars are not important. If you're sending ten dollars, it is they, they are important. So there are a number of avenues that we will explore. There are other layer ones that have emerged. I was talking about when we were running transactions at 100%, that was on a different uh, layer one. In the time since we have done that, 
there has been a ton of activity on, on layer twos on Ethereum. I actually think that's a very promising uh, development. And we are quite frankly now evaluating where do we go from there? If we want to be in a transaction that will uh, on, a, on a network that will give us one cent per transaction between one to two uh, seconds in settlement time, which are the options? And I, I will not give you names, but when you run the names, there will be four or five names that are, that are there. And, and we're interested by design. Uh, we always assumed that it was going to be multi-chain. And where do we go in, in terms of the next chain, something that we're paying a ton of attention. So you mentioned uh, regulators' attitudes toward uh, the Ethereum blockchain. And I agree with you. I think regulators would probably be most comfortable with that one. But at the same time, some regulators, including our federal bank regulators, aren't comfortable with any decentralized blockchain. Um, because of the risks of not knowing exactly who is transacting, because of resilience risks, because of you know where are the validators located or where are the people you know that are involved in processing transactions located, um, how do you think about that? And how do you think about the fact that you know when we look at what um, big banks are doing? I mean, there was an announcement yesterday about Citi's new tokenized deposit thing yes. for shipping and so forth. And it was a very interesting announcement because they talked about this new thing they were doing and they said, well, it's, you know, it's kind of private permission, but we're still interested in uh, these other open, more open uh, chains and sources. So how do you, how do you think about those issues? About tokenized deposits versus well, not so, so, No, more about the, the risks of how did you all get comfortable that with decentralized blockchains generally, given the criticisms and do you see the things that people are worried about, particularly bank regulators, do you think you've got answers to those concerns? Yep. So one of the reasons why our uh, stablecoin is issued out of New York is that I give a ton of credit to the Department of Financial Services in New York because I think they have one of the most comprehensive and rigorous uh, structures out there. Definitely the most strict in the US and one of the more strict uh, worldwide. And they have done a ton of really deep work around the protocols and understanding and, and, it, and their guidance on cybersecurity risk is a spot on. They have spent, spent a ton of time. And we'll talk about the state versus federal in, in, other, in other cases. One of the benefits that we have being PayPal is that we are active in 200 markets in, in the world. It's very uncommon. Financial services usually don't travel that well. It's very uncommon that a regulated financial institution can be active in so many markets. And we take our regulatory relations very, very seriously. And, and it's a two-way street. Obviously, we spend a ton of time with our regulators in the US, but also in the UK, the European Union, in Singapore, in Japan, in all the places where we operate. And th they are some, I would say, I was going to say they are excited. And, and they are excited, different, some in the positive terms, some in the, in the less positive term. But I think that there is an acknowledgement in the rural, regulatory community that digital assets are here to stay, that they will not die quietly and that they are not an anarcho-libertarian corner of the boots, that there is real, I'm, I'm a very unlikely crypto revolutionary and there is a lot of people like me in the, in the traditional financial systems out there. So I think there is an acknowledgement that they're going to be part of the ecosystem. There is a eagerness to learn about the space and there is an, uh, an acute interest to see how does that impact to the regulatory mandate, which remember in most of the cases is about uh, financial stability, consumer protections, anti-money laundering. Uh, we have spent a ton of time uh, thinking about that. I think that there are very strong, and the construct that we have has really good questions for all those uh, three things, how we think about, and we have spent a ton of time on which are the assets that are back in the stable coin? Where do those assets sit? What is the bankruptcy remoteness provision? What, what happens in the event of something happening to the issuer or something happening to PayPal? How do you monitor? One of the things that, that we made a very conscious decision four years ago is that the digital asset activity at PayPal was going to sit at the core of what PayPal does. So I have the privilege of running a unit of 200 people who the only thing they do all day is digital assets. But it's not a speedboat on the side of paper. So when you think of our risk and compliance uh, procedures, our risk framework is an extension of PayPal's risk and compliance framework. Adjusted for the reality of digital assets, obviously, but 
the dozens of investigators that we have that are monitoring activity on the web sit with the same investigators who are monitoring uh, activity in the web when all of you are doing payments with your traditional PayPal wallet. And that infrastructure for digital payments that PayPal has built over the last 20 years is now being deployed for the benefit of, of uh, our digital currency activity. Most of the regulators that I've found, once the, the sigh of relief when, when they hear that, and we have done extensive meetings on each of those topics on Again, as I said, why are you using this type of asset and not that other type of asset? What happens if systems go down? What are the cybersecurity provision? All that, and rightly so, because we, we have millions of people who are interacting with, with crypto uh, on our platform. So, and, and the crypto industry for longer than, than we should have, there have been players in the crypto industry who have been a little bit cavalier about that regulatory side of the house. If if you are in financial services, you're going to be in a regulated space. I would argue that if you're working on anything that matters, more likely than not, it's going to be regulated, regulated whether it is financial services or healthcare or energy or education. Uh, the regulators are not out to get you. The regulators are there to protect the, the public, and they want to be educated, and they mean well. So we have the benefit of engaging with New York, federal agencies in the U.S., a, my team has is, is part of the engagement task force from the Basque, uh, from the Bank of England and His Majesty Treasury in the UK. I'm just coming from Singapore. We were talking about that last week, where the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, who regulates our activity there, is one of the most forward-looking regulators in, in digital assets. So I think that there is, a, a, and, and the sophistication of the questions that you receive from regulators these days has nothing to do with what it was, let's say, two years ago. But one of the complaints about Ethereum is gas fees. And yet you're saying this is very cheap to transfer. Help us understand the, the, that. Uh, first of all, things are, are relative. Gas fees are high. If I'm sending you $10, $10 on the Ethereum blockchain, I have not looked at gas fees today, but it would be anything between $1 to $5, which is obviously expensive. Uh, if I'm sending you $10 million and then I'm, I'm spending the same $5. It's, it's interesting. One thing that uh, most of the payments industry works on a percentage is ad valorem. It works. The cost is a percentage of the amount that you're sending. Mm -hmm. Blockchains couldn't care less. The, the, the cost of stamping a transaction on a block, if it is one cent or one billion, is the same. And, and that provides an opportunity to move from that ad valorem uh, cost to, to something that is more per transaction. Mm -hmm. Having said that, yes, Ethereum does not solve well for micro for microtransactions. If you look at, there have been layer one uh, protocols now that, and this is information that was published by Circle, which is again in the range of one cent per, per transaction. If you're moving value in layer two, on so Ethereum, you would get in that same range. And then there are protocols that you can use that are basically, I wouldn't call it free, but it's gonna be 0 0.0001. They are not as tried and tested on, as mm -hmm. Ethereum, but now it becomes an engineering problem, not a science problem. So the, the cost per transaction will continue to go down. And how does that affect me as a PayPal account holder if I want to use the stable coin? What am I paying to use it? So if you're interacting, imagine that you're getting it on, on your PayPal wallet. You can get into your PayPal wallet today. You can go into Venmo very quickly, very soon um, and find it. You're not going to pay any fees to buy it. Once that you have it, you can use it to... First, you can use it to pay anywhere that, that PayPal is, is accepted, which is a relevant thing because it means that think without of the, a fee. Without a fee. Yeah. So anything that you do in the financial, in, inside the PayPal ecosystem does not have a fee. It means like, mm -hmm. imagine the financial inclusion aspect of that. Uh, I live in California. There is a three, in, I live in Silicon Valley, three hours from where I live, Sierra County in the middle of California. There is not one bank branch. In the in the whole of is what is called a banking uh, desert. Mm -hmm. So if you are not you, you don't have access to a bank account, still somebody could send you dollars, digital dollars to your PayPal wallet, and then you can use it at the millions of merchants where PayPal is accepted. Mm -hmm. So the amount of liquidity and utility that that gives a stablecoin, I think it is it is a match. So I can have a PayPal account without having a bank account. Yes, you can have a PayPal account. Just you, you need to provide your name and email and an address, and then you're good to go. If you're going to be interacting with digital assets, uh, one of the regulatory considerations is you, you're going to go through enhanced 
a due diligence, but you don't need to have a bank account. Right. So you can you can buy it with no fees. You can use it to pay anywhere anywhere PayPal is accepted with no fees. You can trade against uh, other uh, digital assets. You can do pay USD to Bitcoin and and, and back. Mm -hmm. You can send it to other folks on the PayPal ecosystem instantly, no fees. You can send it to millions of folks on the Venmo ecosystem, instant, no fees. You can send it outside PayPal uh, to a MetaMask wallet, to a Phantom wallet, to a Coinbase wallet. We will not charge anything. The, the, the protocol will charge a fee that we'll collect from you and, and then pay, the, pay the, the validators. So we definitely have an interest in being able to bring those, those transaction costs down over, mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one last question, or maybe maybe a multiple question about regulation, and then we'll and we'll invite questions from the audience. Um, you described that you're regulated under New York law, and of course, PayPal is regulated at the state level, as are all essentially non-bank payment companies in the U.S. because we don't have a federal framework for regulation of, of payment companies. But you did engage a lot with federal regulators. Um, there have been efforts to create a stablecoin, a federal stablecoin regulatory framework. I've advocated that for a few years now. And there have been some activity in Congress. Um, the House recently, House Committee recently adopted a bill, as most of you know. But when you announced um, the uh, ranking member of that committee, Maxine Waters, who used to chair it, expressed her deep concern over the fact that you were doing this because there wasn't a federal framework. Um, how do you think about those issues? There's a ton there, Tim. How, <laughs> how much time <laughs> do we have? That's so, se several things. Let, let me address the regulatory side, and then when we, yeah. talk, uh, we can talk about the legislative uh, side. Um, as I said, I grew up in Spain and did a lot of my payments career in, in Latin America. I've been in the US for 12 years. I remain a student of banking and payments regulation in the U.S. It's fascinating. I, 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 I can't <laughs> think that, that you have a federal and state system for the regulation of banks, that you have payments at the money transmitter license level, and then that you have uh, at least three different agencies that have a, a way of, of uh, some, some type of oversight. And then you have a federal, you have FinCEN that regulates on the money laundering, but gets implemented through the state. Is if you're a payments crazy. nerd, is, is I was going to say it's fascinating, but it, it might be a little bit crazy too. So several things uh, there on, if you look at what the Europeans are doing with MICA, which is, um, I have, there are things in MICA that I don't like, which is the, the marketing crypto assets, the, regular, the, the, framework for crypto. the framework for crypto assets for the whole of the European Union. One thing that they do is they have a very clear, it provides a very clear set of guardrails, that famous regulatory clarity that, that the industry has been claiming for. In, in Europe, it's clear. You might agree or disagree, but it's, but it's very clear. One advantage that, that Europe had is that Europe has uh, a figure of e-money, electronic money which is very clearly defined as a payment instrument. And regulators usually work by analogy. There are different buckets. And when something new comes, they say, hey, in which bucket do I put this thing? And payment stable coins are a very good fit for e-money in Europe. So it's easy to say, hey, this is basically electronic money. You can use it for payments. You can have an e-money license and then you can issue it. There's, there's an, that e-money concept does not exist in the US. Your PayPal balance in Europe is e-money. Your PayPal balance in the US is a store value, which is basically the analogy is a prepaid card. It's value that gets there and, and, and then it's used for, for something. So that creates a number of complications. Uh, when you think about digital representations of value on the regulatory side, so this is basically a combination of three things. Stable coins, which is what we have been uh, talking about. In my mind, payment stable coins are e-money, they're a payment instrument, they belong into the payment uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. Tokenized deposits, we were talking about our friends in the banking industry, which their version of why do you need a blockchain for is why do you need the stable coins if we can just have tokenized deposits. Uh, a couple of counters to that. The first one, quoting St. Anselm, existence is an attribute of perfection. So stable coins exist and tokenized deposits don't. So when to tokenized deposits exist, we will have a look at them. But one of my favorite sports is discussing with a friend of the banking side and, and doing three follow-up questions about how a tokenized deposit would work. 
because they run out of answers very quickly. Because they mean they are the famous article about wildcat money in my mind, and this is my opinion, not PayPal's. Tokenized deposits are the definition of wildcat money. So if I have one dollar in a deposit from JP Morgan that has been tokenized from JP Morgan Chase, and you have one dollar in a deposit that is issued by a small regional bank with a hundred million in, in the balance sheet, do those things trade at par? Really? Uh, because you are taking counterparty, it's commercial bank money. You're taking counterparty risk on, on, on the bank. Sometimes I I guess lecture a, a class on money and banking in, in that other school on the West Coast. And when I start, I always ask, how many of you think that the money in your bank account is yours? I will not do that here. The money in your bank account is not yours. You are lending money to a bank with the promise that they will give you the money back when you ask for it. But you are that's the definition of commercial bank money. And just to clarify, if I have if I have a PayPal stablecoin, that's in a sense a claim, you know, against you. But you're saying it's different because you've got a pool of reserves. It's not leveraged the way, say, Correct. bank. Correct. So bank the assets are. that go into the reserve. You should understand that. You you give us one dollar, we give you a token worth one dollar, and that dollar that you gave us stays in reserve assets, which are cash and cash equivalents. Basically, is short-term treasury bills, deposits in banks, and overnight repos. We can, and actually those reserves are held in accounts that are for the benefit of the PayPal token holders. They're not PayPal accounts, they're not Paxos, who's our partner who issues the stablecoin, they're for the benefit of, uh, of the token holder. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have a PayPal account to be able to redeem your token back to, to a dollar. And we don't lend it out, we don't rehypothecate it. That's one of the, so I'll, I'll go back, but, but that's, that's that's the main difference. Important. It's not a fractional reserve, if you want the analysis is a full reserve in the sense that it doesn't go to the to the credit cycle. So you have the stable coins, you have commercial bank money that is tokenized, uh, and then you have central bank money tokenized, which is what it has been called a CBDC or central bank digital currencies. I do think those three things will coexist. Centr a digital representation of central bank money in a world where cash is disappearing is important for the central bank because it's the only way they can put money in the hands of the public Mm -hmm. without the intermediation of uh, of a bank. Imagine that you're in a place like Sweden, which basically cash is not in circulation anymore. If you're the Reichsbank, you're the Central Bank of Sweden. Basically what it means is if I am a consumer, uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a citizen and the banks will not open a bank account for me, I am outside the economy because they, the, the Central Bank has no way to give me access to Central Bank money. So digital representation of money from Central Bank Actually, it's fascinating because the debate in the places where that is working, which is largely China, Nigeria, and some of the Caribbean islands, it has been working, and not at scale yet. The debate in the US is very, very polit politicized. It has to do mostly with surveillance of who has the right to issue a CBDC, and can the Fed do it or, or, or not. But I do believe that we will see CBDCs, we will see tokenized deposits, we're already seeing uh, stable coins. The other aspect that Tim, that you were asking about is, who should be able to issue stable coins? My opinion, which is the same opinion of, of New York and many others in the industry, is that payment companies should be, it should be regulated financial institutions. You don't need to be a bank. Uh, there are some in the banking industry and some on the regulatory side who argue, I think that the presidential working group uh, said that the report from 2022 said that much and their initial opinion was, say, banks should be in charge of issuing stable coins. I disagree with that. Uh, if you're, what banks do is they take deposits from the public and they lend them out, which is a fundamental function for the working of the economy and that function has to happen. But if you don't engage in taking deposits from the public, you don't engage in maturity transformation, short term to long term, you don't rehypothecate assets, you are not in the business of banking. So you shouldn't need a banking charter to be able to, to do that. I mean, the undersecretary for the treasury did kind of broaden the view after that yes. report came out and suggesting, well, you know, it could be, you know, she didn't quite use these words, it was sort of a narrow bank concept, but it's still unclear exactly what that would mean and they haven't really come out with any details on that. And the debate between federal and state, moving maybe to the legislative side, uh, Tim is absolutely right. After we launched, uh, ranking member Waters issued that letter saying that she was deeply, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but only slightly because I've seen that letter many, many times. Is that they were deeply concerned 
that PayPal was launching in absence of a federal framework. So it's not that she had an issue with us, uh, it's that she wanted a federal framework to be available. Uh, And that letter was in reply to another letter that uh, Patrick McHenry, the the chair of the House Financial Services Committee also uh, published after we launched where he was saying, hey, this is a positive development and and it just confirms that we need to legislate in in this space. And it's to your point about how fascinating it is to watch the American system at work. And further evidence of that was a hearing last week by the very same committee on central bank digital currencies, where you had a lot of people saying they shouldn't, we shouldn't even let the Fed work on this. So, correct. There's one of the bills that has (laughs) the title of the bill is something like no digital prevention for digital dollar bill. I can't remember. It's something like that. All right, let's get some questions from people here. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, so with the Lightning Network, when PayPal is making things really faster and cheaper, the use of the micropayment that you mentioned, could also make a blockchain or launch a federal network. Okay, the question, just in case they didn't hear it on the webinar, it was about the Lightning Network on Bitcoin is making it faster. Would that be a good basis for micropayments? Um, I yeah. I do think that the Lightning Network is a is a good way for micropayments. The problem with it is obviously built on on top of Bitcoin, so you solve or you partially solve the problem of speed and scalability. You still have the volatility associated to the asset because those payments are in Bitcoin, so it will still move. Uh, there are some initiatives out there to deploy stable coins on Lightning based on Bitcoin. I've heard the story i've read the paper i still don't understand it how technically it can work uh but it could be an alternative if, if you're able to move stable i i thought it was impossible but also i thought it was impossible to do nfts on bitcoin and and, and they are there they collapse the network but they are there yeah others yeah hi i'm a hbs student my question is will paypal pass the interest to the holders um, that, uh, for example, Tether holds eight billion worth of, you know, USDT, um, and I've read reports they're they're printing about one point five billion dollars worth of revenue in Q just Q one this year, right? And a lot of them are invested in similar assets that you mentioned, you know, key bills and so on. Um, so, and and then a very big debate in the industry is whether part of that should be passed on um, to the token holders. And um, there are many other, you know, stable coins have been experimenting differently. For example, Dai, um, uh, MakerDAO have passed that to yeah. various teams. Yeah, there is there is a business aspect of that, and then there is a security slow consideration of that, which I think probably team knows way better than definitely way better than me, and way better than anyone else that that I know. So let me talk about the business model, and and then we can talk about the security slow consideration. A Current monetization of large scale stable coins has been driven by the yield of the reserve assets. As, as you were saying, uh, for those of you who are less familiar with it, the issuer of the stable coin in most cases keeps the return from the, they, they, inver, they invest the reserve in those cash like instruments, they generate the yield, and the issuer keeps the yield. When you're talking about $80 billion in this uh, interest rate environment, that's bigger than a bread box. So it's, the, the monetization model for the issuers has been the deal of the reserve. Personal opinion, I think that is temporary and in a way perverse. Uh, I think that much more because it, it forces or incentivizes stable coin issuers to chase size over velocity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I care way less about the asset size of the PayPal stable coin. I care way more about the circulation because I want to make sure that people are using it for something. Yeah. So that is, it, and, and it's a moment in time if we continue to have a disinterest rate environment for 10 years, then we will have a different set of problems. So eventually, my contention is that stable coins will be monetized through transaction fees one way or, or the other. That's not where the industry is today. Uh, the other aspect of your question, as I said, Europe, very clear, payment stable coins are in money. This is how you regulate money, you're good to go. Uh, the US, digital assets are... In principle, at least Bitcoin and, and, and clearly Bitcoin, 
kind of clearly uh, Ethereum, maybe less others. Uh, and this is literally, Tim knows better than anyone else. Bitcoin is defined as a commodity. So Bitcoin is property. Uh, there is, if you ask, depending if you ask the CFTC or you ask the SEC, they will tell you that some things are commodities and some things are, are securities. And the SEC will say, if something is a security, then I will I have the right, so the obligation, the, the mandate to supervise it. One of the aspects, just to make a long story short, of what is a, a security in the US is the analysis of the investment contract. The legal precedent is something that's called, uh, famously called Howie. Howie has several prongs. One of them is, is there an expectation of profit? So it could be constructed that a uh, stable coin that depending on how it's constructed, but a stable coin that generates yield from the consumer, you could argue that the consumer is buying the stable coin with expectation of making a profit. And therefore, there, there could be grounds to consider that as a security. So that's why I think that one of the aspects in which the industry has been refraining, and they have been actions against Coinbase and, and others and our, our investigations along those lines. But I think that team, you're- No, 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 you've got it exactly right. I mean, if you were to pay interest, I think you would have people say, mm, that probably makes it a security. And then you've got the questions of, you know, is it then subject to regulation by the Securities and Exchange Commission versus looking at it as a payment instrument and having it regulated as a bank-like product. But this is, you know, again, where I think our bank regulators have gotten it completely wrong. And it goes to your, also to your asset versus velocity point because they've been concerned about stable coins. So they've tried to limit the interconnections between stable coins and banks. And therefore, if you wanna use a stable coin, you buy the stable coin and you keep the stable coin and you have an account with lots of stable coins. If we allowed those interconnections then people might just view the stable coin as a payment mechanism and you would keep your money in the bank or you would keep it somewhere else where you could earn a return. And then you would use the stable coin when you needed to. And to your point, you're, you'd be happy with that because you're concerned more about the velocity of transactions than the asset size. L look into your PayPal app today. You will see there is a crypto tab where you can buy the stable coin and you can use it. There is a savings product in the PayPal app that today pays you point. 4.3% APY is a savings account provided that it's synchronic. It is a registered bank that is a partner of ours. So you can split those things. You can have stable coin and say, hey, you know what? I don't need a stable coin right now. Inside the same PayPal app, I sell the stable coin and move the money into my high yield savings account. And when I want to go back into crypto, I, I sell that instantly shows up. So there is not a need in my mind to have the asset generate the yield. Uh, if you are not care, you, you don't care about that perverse incentive that the monetization mechanism for stable coins for the issuer is the reserve. Other questions? Yeah. Is there online? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, we, we said at the beginning, I think. I, I'm a believer in open source uh, technology. And I think that there is, first, it's incredibly difficult to build and maintain emphasis and maintain a, a, a product that is proprietary. And that's something which, and if you remember back in the Libra days, Libra started to have the DM protocol, was a, a protocol that was maintained by, by them. And then eventually, the progeny of Libra, there are a couple of, of comp protocols out there who were the, the offspring of the technology that Facebook built, who have become open source. Uh, I do think that the open source uh, movement has many advantages in general and in something where the DNA of decentralization is as close to the core as it is in the blockchain environment, it, it just would feel weird to have a PayPal protocol out, out there. Never say never, but I think that uh, the, in principle, that's not what we are contemplating. Question. Yeah, I think that we were just talking about that. The uh, stable coin issuers today mostly monetize the, the interest on the on the reserve assets. Uh, I think that as we get real or increase utility and we get adoption as a payment instrument and it moves from wallet to wallet, both, uh, and definitely was something there again, even going back to liberal original days in, in that paper, there was some comment that eventually there would be transaction fees. I think that when this moves at scale, 
there will be transaction fees for interacting in, in a stablecoin. Also remember that a payment is much more than a transaction. So moving, when we talk about the cost, we are talking about moving the asset from one wallet to another wallet. If you're in the payments business, that's only the beginning of the fun. Then you need to start to do things like how do you handle fraud? And how do you handle disputes and reconciliations? And how, if you're a merchant, how do you integrate that with your ERP? Again, going back to the ERP, it, sorry, to the open source analogy, there will be the protocol and then the similar to Red Hat on, on Linux, there will be services that are built on top of the protocol that people will monetize. Okay. My, Go ahead. Please. My point of view is long term, the monetization mechanism will probably be more transaction fees and services on top of those transactions than the deal on the reserve. Well, there was another question and then, and then I'll ask this question. Yeah. So the two questions are, uh, how is uh, PayPal stablecoin different to the Libra project and the current asset base, which is 44 million, uh, which you can see on Etherscan is one of the beauties of, of blockchains. Uh, do we expect that that's going to uh, increase? So PayPal is a payments company. I think that that's the, we have been a regulated financial institution for 20 years. So this is, this is what we do for, for a living and, and we are very comfortable as I said, in terms of our regulatory processes, our regulatory infrastructure, our regulatory relations, I don't think that anything that we have done on, on, on the on the stablecoin side from a technology point of view is radical innovation. I, I think that we are deploying an ERC-20 token on Ethereum protocol. It's a tried and tested mechanism that has been done before. You know, what is different on our side is that we are probably the first large scale traditional finance company who's doing that on a permissionless environment. Oh, there is, there is a, there is a stable coin issued by JP Morgan Chase. There is a JPM coin or JP coin or something like that, that is in a permission environment. But I think that we were the first ones uh, on the, on the permissionless side. And it's mostly because again, we are a regulated financial institution at core and we've been in payments for, for many, many years. I think that that's the key defining uh, difference. Hey, on the, on the asset side, a uh, short answer is yes. So if one year uh, uh, from now, uh, team invites me back and the asset size is at 45 million, then we'll say, okay, we'll, we launched this thing and nobody wanted it. So that, that's that's fine. I think it's, we have always said that we're going to be prudent on, on, how, this, on how this grows. Uh, and it's funny because in different, when I'm in crypto, uh, remember that we announced six weeks ago, external liquidity started to appear four weeks ago. Everything is in the eye of the beholder. I can tell you that I am in rooms where the question is, why is it only? 45 million. I am in rooms on where the question is, how did you get to 45 million in four weeks? So uh, we are managing this prudently. Uh, if you think in terms of adoption, in four weeks, the, the token is listed in exchanges that are about 40% of all trading assets outside of Binance. So in four weeks, you can get it on Coinbase, you can get it on Kraken, you can get it on crypto.com, you can get it on Bitstamp. It is supported in MetaMask, in Ledger, in Phantom. Most custodians, custodians are a critical part of the ecosystem. Most custodians are supporting that already. So we always said, I don't care about the asset. I don't care about the asset size. I care about relevance. So you know, I think that in order to influence the industry, we need to be a top four, top five stable. And 45 million will not get us there. But it's going very, very much according to, to our plan and I can tell you that I, I do refresh that Etherscan page often, uh, but I am confident that we will close the year where we where we think that it makes sense on a growth path that is not a runaway train. So it's, it's important for us that we have been very incremental in the way we have been running our crypto business, and this is not an exception.
I'm wondering about the question about structures. Do you think that will have any impact on wholesale quantity of property versus cost of transaction? Absolutely. Uh, I think that is, if you observe payments, not only the U.S. is a fascinating uh, regulatory environment, cross-border payments and the predominance of SWIFT and, and then the correspondent bank system. I will not bore you to death with a dissertation on the correspondent banking system, but there are high margins there. And I think that that, that high margins are an opportunity for people to, to get there. It requires something that we haven't seen yet, which is stable coins denominated in multiple currencies. So if you look at the stablecoin space today, most of that, the vast, vast, vast majority of that is denominated in USD, which, by the way, is a good thing for the US. Uh, but it's also because most of the activity is dedicated to crypto trading, and most of the crypto trading pairs are denominated in USD. I think that is stable that uh, our dear competitor, Circle, they issue a euro-denominated uh, token, which has, in my opinion, I think has less than 45 million in, in assets, though. So who's watching. Uh, and the, the reason is that for crypto trading, you don't need a euro denominated stable coin. If your use case, Tim and I were just discussing uh, before the session, if you're an American company that is gonna pay a supplier in Japan and you can settle 24 seven, 15 minutes, all that, there are two ways to do that. You send dollar denominated stable coin to the counterpart in Japan. They receive that in a wallet. They convert that to from stable USD to fee at the end into their bank account. Probably their bank in Japan monetizes that effects. Or you go to a place in which somebody sends a stable US, the merchant receives stable yen, and then what is withdrawn is stable yen to fiat yen. The value creation is the same. The value capture is different. And I think that's a battle that will be fought. I'm going to riff a little bit, but I think it's going to be, a, there will be digital business, absolutely. If you think of, there is a custodian company from Israel a company called Fireblocks, a, which already has a merchant settlement product in stablecoin, meaning that, that you can send a bill and the bill can be settled in a stablecoin and, and Fireblocks, you're the merchant, Fireblocks will open a crypto wallet for you and deposit that on, on a stable coin and you can withdraw it or you can circulate that and keep it on, on a stable coin. So I, I think that on the, and, and they are, if you ask people in the Web3 ecosystem, everybody knows Fireblocks. If you and I go to the street and ask 10 people passing by if they know about Fireblocks, nobody will know them. So definitely early adoption will happen on the Web3 space. The other maybe less intuitive case that I think that you will see is people who have to do have to make payouts to distributed either employees or contractors or network payments, meaning Airbnb every day sells, sends payments to, to, uh, to millions of hosts all over the world. Etsy sends millions of payments to Etsy sellers everywhere. Many of those are going to be cross-border payments. Many of those will benefit from, from the speed. And many of them are saying, hey, I would rather keep my, my payment dollar denominated if I am in Guatemala than converted into, into digital currency. So I think that payouts to the distributed forces or partners and, and Web3 companies will go first. I might be totally wrong. I'm hearing that some of the large ERP companies are already introducing a stablecoin settlement options in their financial software. So these things move with regulation and they move also with enterprise movers. payment isn't just a payment, you then have the fraud and reconciliation and so forth. What about in terms of, of fraud and mistakes? I mean, one of the things we always hear about blockchains, of course, is they're immutable. But of course, for those of us all used to our credit cards and the ability to call up the credit card company and say, hey, there was a mistake here, please reverse the transaction. And they do. How do you think about, how do you, how do you address those issues? Settlement is final. And I think that that's been a learning experience for, for many folks in the in the crypto space. And, and that's why we spend on our retail crypto product, we spend so much time making sure that people understand. If you're doing a transfer, 
Make sure you get the right, the right address. Don't sell Bitcoin to Ethereum wallet. Don't send, don't for protect yourself against scams because it's it's difficult to get that that money that money back. It's interestingly, it's very easy to trace. So from a global financial crime ability, you are actually able, reasonably able to get that money back because eventually that money will make it to a bank account uh, some somewhere. But it is it is different to fiat payments. It is. Uh, then the money is not sitting on a bank account for until they prove prove that there are good funds for for days. So it's different. Part of those services, as we were saying, we we have been payments for uh, twenty years. And one of my dear colleagues at PayPal, when when he describes PayPal, he say we are a cybersecurity company that happens to move money, and it's very 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 true. And if you look at the, the implication of that for our digital assets business, we are the only company that I know who provide a warranty for our crypto product in the sense that if somebody gets an authorized access to your PayPal wallet and wipes your crypto, we cover you up to $50,000, which is the vast, vast majority of, of what somebody would hold with, with us. I don't think that any other company out there is doing that because that requires that you need to know what you're doing on 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 the cyber side and on the on the payment side. Uh, we are not charging for that right now, but I think that the industry will move in a way in which again there will be service value added services that are added to the transaction that people will choose to monetize, and you cannot withdraw the transaction, but maybe people will find other liquidity ways to be able to simulate that dispute settlement. Well, Jose, thank you so much for spending time with us. This has really been fascinating. Thanks to everyone who's here. And let's give Jose a round of applause.